he stated, oh, I couldn't have been there that date on the uh, December 26th because I was in jail. Nobody bothered to check the jail records. He hadn't been in jail for three weeks prior to that. That's the investigation we're talking about. They also don't bother to mention that a Department of Corrections official, this isn't somebody from the defense, a Department of Corrections official, Lieutenant Aponte, provided them with a tape. He claims, told all of us, that he gave them a tape of a conversation in which one of the prisoners was talking to his brother on the phone when Lacey Peterson came up and they basically made comments about knowing what happened to Lacey and let's shut up, be quiet, don't talk about it anymore. That tape was, according to Lieutenant Aponte, given to the Modesto police. They deny it. They say they never received it. But regardless, Lieutenant Aponte reported it, turned it in, and we have a declaration from Lieutenant Aponte about what was said and that, in fact, it was heard and was on tape and that he did, in fact, provide them the tape. All of these things indicate, again, the burglary is what we should be looking at, but they refuse. They refuse to acknowledge it. They refuse to look at it. And when you question them, again, ask them, what evidence do they have it occurred December 26th? We want to know. If they've got that evidence, provide it to us. We're happy to look at it. Yes. Allocution, yes. Uh, Mr. Peterson was prepared to give a statement. The judge had issued an order as far as who was to speak. She did not mention in the order an allocution whether or not she would allow an allocution or not. Uh, she mentioned as far as the, the Rocha family, who would she allow to speak. Uh, so I questioned her and asked her if she would allow him to make an allocution, allow Scott to speak, and she said no, she would not. You would have to ask the judge about that. I, I don't know why she. There's there's case law in California about defendants talking during a sentencing hearing and what they can and can't say. Uh, depending on the specific case, there there are just various things you can interpret it. Apparently, what her interpretation was or, or her decision, she has wide discretion as to what she can allow at a sentencing hearing, and her discretion was that she was. Uh, better not for him to speak. What did he want to say? What did he want to say? I think what he would like to have said is he wanted to talk about the fact that he did one of the things that really upsets him is this concept that he did not want to have a child. And he wanted to talk a little bit about that and the fact that he would never, ever harm Lacey and Connor. I think he wanted to talk about the fact that they went to great lengths to have a child. Uh, I mentioned in the, in the hearing uh, how he would come home during the best times of the day. I mentioned that they actually bought a house in Modesto uh, for the sole purpose of starting a family. Uh, there were Lamaze classes and friends they were doing things with. Uh, he had had family members, despite what the prosecution says, there are a number of people who will testify how excited he was, including their partner at the Lamaze class, who he discussed at length how they were going to dress up their boys, uh, they were going to teach them how to hunt and fish and all kinds of things like that. There's a number of witnesses to that, and I think he wanted to talk about that. And I think he just also wanted to reach out and tell the Rocha family that he understands their feelings, and he understands why they believe that he is guilty but he wanted to make it clear that there is no way he could have possibly harmed Lacey and Connor. And I think that's the essence of what he was going to say. It sounds like it, yes. It sounds like he'll be here until the, uh, until the hearing. The next hearing has to do with juror misconduct, the issue of juror misconduct. So what will happen is there will be witnesses, there'll be testimony, as to whether the jurors, a specific juror, committed misconduct and whether it was prejudicial. Um, I think she set aside about a week for the hearing, so there'll be a number of witnesses and a number of things that'll be introduced from both sides. If she finds that, in fact, misconduct was committed and that, in fact, it rises to the level of prejudice, then there will be a new trial. She will grant a new trial.
and that's what we're obviously hoping for. I, I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. Well, any sentencing is hard, as you can see why, but Scott is focused on the hearing on the juror misconduct issue. That's the important hearing for us because that could hopefully result in a, in a retrial. So that's what he's focusing on. Yes, Janie. Janie. Have at her. We're here today because Judge DeLuke made an error during jury selection in 2004 of Scott's trial. We're going to be back here in two months for a juror misconduct issue in Scott's 2004 trial. And that is not where the problem started. The problem started when Lacey went missing and the Modesto police did not follow up on sightings or evidence that she was alive. They focused strictly on my brother-in-law because he was having an affair. And as you heard today in a sentencing hearing, you did not hear one detail about how this crime occurred. You heard details about my brother-in-law's infidelity and my brother-in-law ordering pornography on a cable news station. This is a murder trial. This is a capital murder trial. He is in prison for murdering his wife and unborn son. There is no forensic evidence. There is no timeline to this crime. Scott Peterson is innocent. And we are now trying to reverse that. And you need to ask yourself, what time this crime occurred? If you think Scott Peterson is guilty, what time did this crime occur? What was Lacey wearing when that crime occurred? If you can't answer those questions, then you shouldn't be saying he's guilty. As Pat challenged you, ask when this burglary occurred, specifically what time? Those questions aren't being asked. And until those questions are asked, we're not gonna to get to the truth. Our family is in this for the long haul. We will be here in two months. We look forward to Scott being granted a new trial. And when he is, we are gonna show that he is innocent. Scott is in prison. He's been in prison for over 18 years for a crime he did not commit. That's the foundation of the question you're asking is how is he doing? That's a very heavy, heavy load to bear. It's a very heavy load to bear. We're focused on justice, we're focused on what's ahead of us, and we're focused on the fact that he will be granted a new trial, if not in state court, by the federal courts. My name is Janie Peterson, and I am Scott and Lacey Peterson's sister-in-law. J-A-N like Nancy, E-Y. Thank you. I'm just going to add one thing. Uh, that is essentially what we ask. We know that a number of you have covered this trial for a long time. Some of you are new. Uh, we know that you're all in the situation with the media. The media is often criticized. We have tried very hard not to be critical because we know what a difficult job you have. But what we would ask is this. We repeatedly see, since the order for the retrial, we have repeatedly seen, once again, the demonization of Scott Peterson. Once it looked like the possibility of a retrial, we saw a number of district attorneys go stand out and have a press conference and accuse Scott Peterson of stealing uh, EDD money that he had falsified and was getting EDD money. They found out that wasn't true and of course there wasn't a press conference stating, well, sorry, we were wrong. We saw that. Then we see an instance where some murder happens down in San Luis Obispo and they start throwing out Scott Peterson's name when it was ridiculous. He had obviously wasn't even around it. But again, the media reports it. And when it becomes clear that in the preliminary hearing he had nothing to do with it, no one prints. Scott Peterson didn't have anything to do with the murder. Then, and this is the thing that I, I think I get very aggravated about, we made a point 
as I stated in court, we made a point of stating that the roaches should speak and be allowed to speak. And let me tell you how that happened. It happened because I went to Scott Peterson, I was talking to him on the phone, and I said, look, there's a lot of interesting law on who can speak at a sentencing hearing. If you would like me to, I could write a motion as to whether or not the Rocha family should be allowed to speak. Scott Peterson is the one who said to me, no, let them speak. They deserve to be heard. I know they're hurting. Let them speak. Yet the prosecution files a memo, sentencing memo with the court, straight out saying that Scott Peterson and his attorneys are trying to keep the Roaches from speaking. Directly opposite of what I had filed in my motion. It was a direct falsehood and they put it in there. I called them on it. I sent them the motion just in case they didn't see it. I asked them to please correct that and their answer was we choose not to do so. That tells you everything you need to know because again what gets printed is Scott Peterson didn't want the roaches to speak at the hearing. The continued demonization of Scott Peterson. So all I'm asking of you is when you hear these things over and over and over stop and look at the past and what has happened and these continual things that he is accused of that have turned out to be absolutely false including number one being accused of the murder of his wife and child and with that I'll let you go thank you